Good afternoon, evening, morning, night, whenever you find a way to see or listen to this. Uh, it's me, Omar, again, with uh, with the Hardware Podcast and uh, Between the Stripes uh, Podcast Network. And we have a familiar face to the show, uh, first time in a while, you know, both our lives have been busy. We have Dwayne Nash from the Yard HBCU Sports. Dwayne, it's great to have you back again, and uh, we got some uh, minor, minorly spicy topics to talk about, you know, not really much coverage, but we can make it spicy. Oh, you know me, I can always make it spicy. That's, <laughs> I, I, I try my best to make it spicy as, or as spicy as possible. Yeah, I mean, that you do, and uh, I, I'm ready to uh, bring some spice, and I'm sure the... Uh, organizers of these two classes we're going to be talking about are glad that you're going to bring the spice too because quite <laughs> frankly there has been no media coverage of uh these two new classics which i mean seem to be good for the local for their respective local regions but there's just no information on any of them i mean uh there are no tweets a twitter search of each of them brings no results um a google search brings very limited uh, mentions and everything so you know without further ado the two classes we're talking about just for some background savannah state released their schedule in late may for this upcoming season and uh i mean a little a, little, a brief aside i mean i was i'm pleasantly surprised with the just with the direction of the savannah state program going eight and two this past year i mean it's it doesn't seem so long ago when they were the lapping stock, stock of fcs football you know with the i think it was like the 77 to seven game against Florida State and like the 84 to nothing game against Oklahoma State. Uh, they, they seem to be, they seem to be at a good level right now, a level where they can play and play uh, respectively, which they did this past year going eight and two, but they released their schedule uh, for this year and hidden in there or snuck into that release was the mention of a classic with Fort Valley State in Macon, Georgia, uh, the hometown of Otis Redding, no less. We love, uh, we love pop culture references here. On this yes, podcast. sir. <laughs> but uh, hometown of Otis Redding, but the Macon Central City HBCU Classic, which this one is a logical one for both schools, as we uh, as we'll uh, as we'll discuss later on in this podcast. So there is that classic, and then uh, Fort Valley State, the other school playing in the the Macon Central City Football Classic, uh, they released their schedule. And they also snuck on another Sunday class, which oddly enough. Uh, Fort Valley State's beginning of their season, their first two games are on Sundays, which I'm not sure the last uh, college team to do that, but it, it's very, it's very interesting. But um, their second game is in Chattanooga in the uh, Chattanooga, I think, River City Classic. These names are very long and, and hard to remember. I know I should have had them written down, but they'll be playing. I have it. It's actually the Chattanooga <laughs> Scenic City HBCU Football Classic. A HBCU. mouthful. HBCU. Yeah, that's like six words. Uh, that is six, six words. Yes. Yeah, it's six words. A very, very long. Uh, it's it's a nightmare for the grounds crew having to uh, paint the logo for that classic in midfield. I I got I, I gotta say, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah, you better come up with uh, an acronym for that one. It's, they man. will. They come up with an acronym. <laughs> so they're playing in that one in Chattanooga, the River City. Uh, of course, Dwayne has you know is dressed accordingly with the with the lookouts hat, something that that I didn't think of. But um, but yeah, so they're playing against Kentucky State. Uh, another quality team, seven and four uh, out of the SEAC. Fort Valley State at five and five this past year. So these classics, you know, kind of came out of nowhere, uh, are in, you know, good, I guess, sizable cities in the South. Uh, Dwayne, what are your initial thoughts about these classics? Wow. Um, like you, I was completely unaware of these classics until you actually came to me and, 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 and informed, them, um, informed me of them. And I do have to give a shout out to uh, the people over there, at HBCU Game Day. And there was another website I can't remember exactly uh, where I saw that information about the uh, the Macon Central City HBCU Football Classic. Another mouthful as well. Um, God, yeah, because it's very little information out on the internet about these classics right now. Um, my guess, just like other HBCU classics, there's some sort of uh, entity that owns them, that organizes these games. Um, and my guess as of right now, they probably don't have a lot of organization and or sponsorship behind these games right now. And I, uh, I, I'm hoping for their sake that they start pumping these games now or advertising these games ASAP so that people can start planning to go to these games and, and, and making their way to their cities especially if they're not in the respective cities of where these schools currently play. Now, in the case of the Chattanooga Classic, that's the one, I think we, we talked about it before the show. Um, both schools in Kentucky State and um, Fort Valley State are at least three and a half hours away. 
from Chattanooga with uh, Fort Valley being th uh, three and a half and Kentucky State being almost five hours away. And then with the uh, making Central against Savannah, at least uh, Fort Valley is about a half hour away and Savannah is about two and a half hours away. So it's in that case, it's not as bad of a drive for them to go to those games. And then with it being in Macon, you probably have alumni from those two schools there in the city of Macon too. So you probably shouldn't have too much of a hard time having fans and alums from Macon come out. And like you said, Otis Rating being from Macon, shout out to Pete Rock for using that Otis Rating sample for one of my favorite Jay-Z and Kanye West songs, Otis. But I digress. You talked about pop rock culture references. I thought I had to go ahead and bring that up. But my guess is that the organizers of that Macon Central City matchup is banking on the fact that they have um, a sizable enough alumni base, if not for the fact that, you know, those two schools are close enough to do a day drive to make it there for them to have that attendance. But yeah, that Chattanooga C Scenic City, they, wait a minute, was Chattanooga one the one that had the website? Um, I think, wait a minute, it is. I think it was, uh, God, was it Chattanooga? It was either Chattanooga or the, no, it's classic from Columbus that I saw the website for. That's another classic that they have. And shout out to um to, to former uh, ANT assistant, now Fort Valley State head coach, uh, Sean Gibbs, his first season there with the Wildcats. He has one, two, three, four, five classics in his very first season. So that's what's that, five games of their 11 total um, for the season. That's going to be insane for them to, uh, for the majority of their role games, if not all of them, to be classics in his first season. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think um, in terms of Fort Valley State, maybe they have a reputation for traveling well, even though uh, for the Red Tails Classic on Labor Day weekend, that may just be sort of like a rivalry now. Like, I guess, I guess like they may be in that position just due to, I mean, being a rival of Tuskegee uh, mm -hmm. in that game too. Um, it's interesting you brought up the Classic for Columbus because, uh, I mean, I'm kind of confused in terms of, like, the website, too, because I, I feel like the website has, like, the, the calendar going towards, like, their countdown leads to the last weekend of August, which I assumed was going to be a Central State, Kentucky State, but mm -hmm. seeing a Fort Valley State, uh, their schedule had Morehouse as the Classic for Columbus, and then seeing Morehouse, their schedule, that not, e like, the Classic for Columbus not even being on their schedule, like, they're just... <laughs> There needs to be some communication on some level, right, right there. So it is a really Nobody confusing situation. Needs to do something, and we exactly. kind of talked about this earlier. Um, as it pertains to, to something else indirectly, but it, it still um makes sense for for this conversation. Um, we have to do better, and I'm saying this in, as an HBCU alum. We need to do better with our marketing and our promotion, and making sure that whatever material that we have out there. It's as um, timely and as, as correct as possible so that people aren't wondering and asking questions as to what is this? And I mean, that, that goes for all over the board. You know, I, I want the institutions to have matching information, the organizers of the game. I want them to have the correct information. I want to be able to know, you know, as a, as a, as a person that covers HBCU athletics, I want to know where the game is going to be held. You know, I, I want to have an idea of whether or not, you know, these fan bases are going to be willing to travel there and what, what their experience may be in that facility, whatever it is. Because to your point, which one was it? I'm still trying to guess which, which stadium it might be in, the one for the, the making Central City. Which stadium, do, do you know what stadium is going to be in? I'm thinking, okay, could it be um, Brad Henderson? Could it be Five Star? Where do you think it might be? Um, I'm thinking honestly Henderson because that's where they had in the past. Um, okay. I mean, I know Mercer, like we mentioned before, I mentioned before the podcast that Mercer's Mercer. off that weekend. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mercer's off that, that weekend. So five star is an option. I, and I'd assume that, um, I guess, I guess, I, I guess not really rental cost, but if that's what it's called. But, um, like the cost to use it would be low because, I mean, I don't think Mercer gets many events like that in that stadium. So I, I can't assume that I can't, I can't think that their um, asking price would be that high. Uh, mm -hmm. somewhere else that I would like to throw in, you know, me always being a fan of ballpark football, something I wrote about too, was um, 
So uh, or, uh, Macon has one of the oldest minor league ballparks in the country in Luther Williams Stadium, home to the Macon Bacon of the you know, ah, Coastal yes. Bays League. Yeah. Um, so why not have it there? I mean, it, it certainly would be a, a great spectacle, historical venue, uh, a good, I guess, a good um, sort of partnership for the first year of that classic. But yeah, I mean, there just needs to be some communication somehow, because like before we know it, it's going to be July. Then before we know it, it's going to be August. And, you know, before we know it, it's going to be the football season. You know, I mean, kind of repetitive, but you get the point here. I mean, we're only three months away or less than three months away from the start of the football season. Um, so, I mean, the ball's got to get rolling here for uh, both these classics. Now, like you said, the making classic isn't as much a tough sell. I mean, just, you know, do the regional proximity of both teams. You know, I feel like that classic hit a slam dunk there for sure. Uh, in those teams, the, uh, the scenic city classic is a bit of a tougher sell, uh, because, you know, Kentucky state's further away. So is a Fort Valley state. And there's also the factor too, that, I mean, Kentucky state fans may be tired of traveling too. Like, I mean, last year, they had the uh, Circle City Classic, then they had the Classic for Columbus. So I don't know whether Kentucky State fans travel that well. I mean, the program is on the rise after what it was. I mean, the triple option truly is working out there in, uh, in Frankfort, Kentucky. Um, but again, like, it, it might be a tough ask, especially if they're giving up a home game, which I would assume they are giving up a home game against uh, Fort Valley State because, you know, it's closer. I mean, the location is closer to them, so... Um, it might be a tough ask for them, uh, you know, in both ways. And I mean, that that game, too. Same question with the stadium. Like, are you going to play it at I'm not sure if uh, Chattanooga Stadium is the only option, which I mean, I, I think it may be. But um, yeah, like same questions there. Well, for Chattanooga, I thought I saw that in past years they held the game at Finley. At Finley. OK. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, that that, may, that makes that makes sense. Um yeah, like a very a very suitable stadium. I know it had the FCS or back in the day Division One AA title game out there uh, for a number of years. But yeah, I mean, e even then, like if there are questions with that with uh, what stadium is going to be hosted in, it's uh, you know they're they're there. So I guess do you see? I guess in terms of future, like uh, I know it's a really early to tell these classics, like. Do you see these classes having some staying power? Um, I I don't think the I don't think the SEAC is as concentrated in terms of classics as say the SWAC or yeah, I guess the SWAC or even like the MEAC is, but I mean, I mean, I, I, I can see these classics surviving, you know, just kind of filling it out this first year and then seeing what happens. I don't know. I would say based upon what I've seen from uh, Fort Valley State's schedule alone, that they probably are more entrenched in classics than the MEAC is at least. Um, and, and it's a wonderful way for them to go ahead and, and promote their games. Because if you think about it, again, like I said before, with the with Fort Bradley State and the five classes that they're playing against, they're all against conference opponents. It's not like they're playing OOCs in these situations. Tuskegee, Kentucky State, Morehouse, Savannah State, and Albany State, an in-state rival. So another in-state rival along with um, Morehouse and Savannah State. So yeah, these are all conference games and they're looking to get bigger attendance by slapping the name classic on it, which, hey, you know what? I don't mind, especially if it works. So to answer your question, though, what, what is the future of this game? If it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. So we have to wait and see exactly what it's going to do this year. And with this, God, we, we all, we're all acting as if, you know, outside is open right now. And we're, we're not as concerned about COVID right now. Um, I'm going to be intrigued to see how a lot of these games look in terms of attendance this year, especially for those that kind of missed out in 2021. <laughs> because they, even though, especially with the SWAC, with their numbers going up, there were still a lot of people who decided to say that, you know what, I'm still going to take this um, pandemic serious. And I'm still going to reserve myself on whether or not I go out or not. But that number seems to be dropping. And I'm looking to see kind of a boost in a lot of attendance this first year, just for people just being tired of being cooped up. And for those that actually missed the 2021 season live that are going to want to go see these um, games in person. So if that game does well, and again, like we just both said, with it being in making, it helps out a lot because of the closest in proximity. Um, maybe it'll do well uh, uh, in, 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 against the fact that they're, they've, they're waiting so late to promote this game. Because like you said, we, we're, 
we're literally a, about a month away from um from the media days for the respective conferences. So it's literally right around the corner. So I'm, I'm going to need them to go ahead and at least be better for uh, for the media folk that are covering, if, if not for the people who are looking to plan and go to this game. But again, it benefits them being that Fort Valley State is a half hour away. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I'm this close to uh, emailing, you know, some of the schools directly, you know, ask, asking some questions, some friendly questions <laughs> about these classes, just so we know more. Uh, and that's a great mm -hmm. point, too, about about more fans wanting to come out and sort of, I guess, yeah, being cooped up and being, I, wouldn't, I don't know, I'm not sure if over the pandemic is a uh, a good term, but I guess I'm not really sure what a good term for that is. But I mean, I feel like, you know what I'm talking about. And like, like, I mean, I'm pretty much just just a piggybacking off off what you said, honestly. And I'm sure uh, those that, that will listen and will watch this understand what I'm saying. But yeah, that, that's a great point in terms of attendance too. And uh, in terms of, I guess, like, you know, this this may be an old experience or I guess it's maybe getting old for Port Valley State fans, you know, because they have the Fountain City Classic. Now they got the Red Tails Classic. It's like, seems like a yearly obligation. Um, but for a school that seemingly hasn't been there for a while, and I think uh, this is kind of a smooth transition to, I guess, the last topic is, uh, is Savannah State being invited to this classic? Is that a sign that they have arrived again? They have returned to the HBCU football scene because I didn't realize in 2019 they went seven and three as well. And then what happens in the spring of 2020? The inaugural, I guess, sort of like test run Gulf Coast Challenge has them playing uh, West Alabama. Um, and that game drew, I guess, a fair pandemic crowd at uh, at Lad People Stadium, about 3,500. And now, uh, you know, no classics really. I guess this past year, no neutral site classic, at least they have their, their home classic in Savannah, but uh, this year being invited to Macon, is this a sign that um, Savannah state has arrived in the SEAC again? Yes. I'm going to go ahead and say it. Yes. As good as they've been playing and it's kind of to be expected. You have a former FCS program moving down to division two. They're still keeping a lot of their old um, FCS recruits. Uh, you would hope, you would hope that they're better. And they played like it, right? So uh, the thing is, you know, with new head coach, what is the new head coach um, for Savannah State's name? I just had it just too, not too long ago. And I'm mad that that window closed that quick. But you got a new head coach. Um, a lot of those guys are now gone. So it's a possibility that, you know, hopefully the talent that they still have there now should be good enough to compete. Um again this year in the SEAC and compete for that division and potentially com compete for um, a conference champion because a championship because I think that they were at least one or two games away from winning the title last year. And you're telling me that I deleted that thing? I guess I did. But yeah, so it's a possibility that one more time that Savannah, Savannah State will be competing for, you know, at least that division. So if they, if they look to do so, look for their fans to come out and support. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you make a, I mean, that's something I overlooked about the the, the leap down from FCS to division two. Um, and I will say, I mean, logically you, you would think it would be that way where they have better athletes or better. They're more competitive at a lower level, but I bring up Idaho, you know, where Idaho, Idaho is like the other, the other instance of a team leaping down a level and, you know, they haven't really been that competitive in the big sky. I mean, you would think that with all that Sunbelt talent that they um, recruited, that they'd be winning championships or at least contending with Eastern Washington, but that simply hasn't been the case. But I mean, I'm glad to see Savannah state using that, uh, that FCS talent and recruiting to their advantage for at least these past couple, these, these next couple of years. I mean, on that point, then do you think it's just a flash in the pan with a, uh, with just these, I guess, uh, leftover recruits that they had from FCS, and it'll sort of go back to the norm. Yeah, I guess the norm when um, these recruits graduate. That is a wonderful question. I really don't know. Um, again, first year head coach Aaron Kelton there in Savannah. I, I got to wait and see how, what he does with this program, especially um, in year two, to see how he develops his players and how they play under him. And I think that that would start to be a, a telltale on whether or not they will continuously be a dominant force within the conference or not but you know we got nothing but time and if no you know what i'm not going to say that i'm not going to be mean to savannah State. <laughs> okay all right well i'll, I'll just, I'll I'll just, just, I'll just say that they're looking good right now we'll see what kilton does in the near future to see if he can continue to make this program relevant for the next few seasons 
Okay. Yeah, that that and that's that's a fair enough assessment to no feelings hurt, honestly. And that's that's what all of us are wondering. Um yeah. so yeah, I mean, so I think for me, when I when I think about Savannah State, I think they have the advantage right now. But it's like when I look at recruiting wise and like the SEAC, um, I gotta think that a team I mean, teams like Fort Valley State and Tuskegee have like the advantage. I mean, especially I really think the Red Tails Classic is a huge advantage where you're you're playing pretty much a game with only one of the game on one of the college game competing with it. Of course, the primetime ABC game on a Sunday night. Um, and if that game's a blowout, then and that get and the uh, Red Tails Classic is competitive, then that is a game that everyone's watching, honestly. So I got to think that's a huge recruiting advantage for both schools, uh, Fort Valley State and Tuskegee. Not just to mention the fact that I mean, a school like Fort Valley State has produced NFL talent. I mean, like Tyrone Poole. I know that was the '90s, but you know, still very, I mean, very relevant. Uh, as well as, and I think it was a first rounder too. I think Tyrone Poole was a first rounder. He was most second. definitely, yeah. yeah, a first rounder out of out of Fort Valley State, and then of course Marquette King too. I mean, mm-hmm. probably like one of the more one of the most well known punters in recent memory, and then of course Tuskegee with the brand Pro Bowler. I mean, Pro, yeah, Pro Bowler, exactly. I think All Pro too, either first or second mm-hmm. team All Pro. Um, and then Tuskegee with the brand that they are, you know, being a, a flagship institution in in uh, I guess in the HBCU landscape. Um, as well as, you know, having the tradition on the football field, too, with the, I mean, the Turkey Day Classic, uh, the Skeegee Morehouse Classic, too, which just moved over to Legion Field. So I got to think, you know, it's going to be an uphill battle fighting those recruiting battles, too, not to mention Albany State. I mean, just being dominant, too. Uh, the recruiting boost that uh, having Gabe, Gabe Giardina coach the uh, HBCU Legacy Bowl on NFL Network, having the coach of that program. I mean, that, that's that's there's something to be said for that. So I do oh, think it's an uphill definitely. battle. Yeah, I think it's an uphill battle. Do I think they'll be horrible um, at like the, on the levels that they were when they were in uh, FCS and in the MIAC? No, but again, like I, I just don't see how sustainable this is. But this being in this classic is a huge step up for the program, and that's that's something that can be a uh, savored right now. Yeah, and, and and to your point in terms of recruiting, I'm really intrigued to see what Sean Gibbs does down in Albany State. Again, like I said before. I'm not tooting his horn because he's, uh, you know, a, a former Aggie in terms of coaching on the staff and being a part of that dominant program, um, especially during its Celebration Bowl run, right? He was most definitely known for not only being a, a wonderful coach there, but a great recruiter, and all the kids loved him. When he decided to make his decision to, move, to go to Fort Valley, to go to Georgia, not only did his current players wish him well, but former players as well. So he most definitely had a huge relationship. I'm wondering whether or not he'll be able to carry that over in terms of recruiting um, kids to come down to, to, uh, to Fort Valley, Georgia, to play for him there. And, 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 and I'm going to be intrigued to see if he just sticks within the state of Georgia or if he decides to come up to his own stomping, old stomping grounds in the state of North Carolina to try to get guys from North Carolina and Virginia to come further south to play for him there too. Because it's going to be very interesting in terms of what the SEAC does with recruiting, with Jackson State, Southern, and Grambling doing what they're currently doing in terms of recruitment right now. A lot of those guys that would normally go to those programs, they're getting beat out now, especially by these guys that would normally choose the likes of um, an FBS program. So where else do they go? You know, they can go to another FCS program or if they want to stay local and play for an HBCU, they'll play in the SEAC. So, you know, it's a possibility that that talent pool now goes to the D2 level and that these coaches end up fighting for those guys too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's something that I just didn't think of. I mean, on the surface, too. I mean, if I'm thinking about uh, D2 recruiting in terms of who's winning those battles, I'm thinking the CIA this year, especially with a guy like Josh Williams getting drafted from Fayetteville State um, to Kansas mm-hmm. City. Um, and then also, too, just, uh, I mean, sort of, I mean, I remember uh, with the HBCU picks and showdown, like, uh, you know, the great defensive backfield they had with uh, Elvin De La Rosa, too, and everything. Um, yeah. just, a, just a program full of ballers. And in, in, uh, I'm trying to think of what other programs. I mean, maybe Bowie State also is, is on the decline in terms of recruiting. But again, another another great power that's had great talent come out recently. I mean, first name that comes to my mind is Amir Hall, the, the, the great quarterback for uh, that. They, mm-hmm. they got the NFL PA uh, bowl appearance. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this very, very interesting with uh, with all the recruiting battles that are happening on all levels. And I mean, it's 
it's from the top down it's from the bottom up it, it, it's it's coming from both directions but um so yeah it'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out in the next few years i mean i'm excited for it yeah and to um to, to piggyback on what you just said especially about the ciaa yeah I, with Bowie being right there in my backyard um and with damon wilson going on to morgan state to see what those two programs are going to do in the next two seasons next three seasons I am highly intrigued by it. You know, with Morgan State having a new AD there, especially an AD that doesn't necessarily have HBCU connections, and then you have a, a, a coach in, in Coach Wilson that has succeeded over at Bowie State the way that he has and is looking to carry carried it over um, to Baltimore in that condensed conference where all it takes is potentially three games to win that conference yeah. and four might most definitely be a lot for you. If he can come in and do that, I don't think he does that necessarily in year one with that quick turnaround coming in in June, getting ready for September. But if he can go ahead and recruit, get his guys in and get himself ready for, um, for 2023. Uh-oh, there might be a problem in Baltimore. And then again, you know, I, I, I didn't necessarily hear who the new head coach is going to be over at Bowie, but will they be able to continue what coach Wilson did? While he was there, there's some people that believe that he they can. I gotta wait and see if it happens, you know. Um, but there are a lot of people um, in 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 Bowie and in the surrounding areas that are hoping so. But you know, they just lost a couple of players, or one of their players going on to Southern, the um, the two time uh, all defensive um, the cornerback that that was there. Bowie is now over in Southern right now. So yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued to see how how that program rebounds now with, with them having to um, reload. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned a transfer. I mean, honestly, I've stopped keeping track of the transfer portal at this point too. <laughs> Literally all, all levels of college football. I mean, who can blame, who can blame uh, this? I mean, this defensive player from, uh, from Bowie state. I mean, cause coach coach leaves. I mean, you can't really, you can't really blame him honestly, but yeah, I mean, so many transfers, but yeah, like, the coaching carousel, honestly, it seems like Morgan State found their guy too. Uh, it seems like Bowie State will, like, I mean, reload too in the CIA. So it's all it's all intriguing this year. So much intrigue in this season, honestly. And I mean, I'm I'm excited for it. I mean, these classics just add a level to it. I mean, we'll uh, you know, I guess I guess to put, sort of put a put a put a bow on it. I mean, you know, maybe Kentucky State, you know, their their option will make a stop in Chattanooga on their way to a SEAC title. You know, uh, who knows? Maybe there's a changing of the guard there. But I mean, I'm really excited to see how these classics shape up because I mean. I'm a huge fan of classics, especially neutral side classics. And I mean, mm -hmm. want them all to succeed, but in a, in a world like this, you know, it's hard, it's hard for, um, you know, all of them to succeed, especially in a, in a midsize in midsize cities like those. But, you know, uh, no matter what we said about the uh, information sharing uh, abilities of these, of these classics, we want, we want them to succeed. Most uh, definitely. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, like, I mean, that, that's just, that's just my final point on this. Uh, I mean, Dwayne, do you have any, anything to add? Um, like you, I can't wait till the football season starts because now, you know, the, the book is now closed officially on the 2021-2022 athletic season with the outdoor track and field championships ending on Saturday. And um, my God, it's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday with Dwayne Ross um, now in Tennessee and, and him taking his son, Randolph Ross, Jr. Randolph Ross Jr. See, I can't even get it out now without sound like I'm about to cry. Um, taking him to, to, to Knoxville as well. Oh my God. I was just telling a friend um, a couple of days ago, watching that outdoor track championships was like listening to a tribe called quest is uh, a tribe called quest album. Uh, the last movement movement, their last album before they came out with that album um, a couple of years ago where everyone knew that the group was about to break up. Yeah. It was, it was sad to, um, to, uh, to, 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 to watch that thing. And for those who don't get that reference of A Tribe Called Quest and that last movement album, I implore you to get a chance to watch that A Tribe Called Quest um, Beats, Rhymes, and Life documentary that they dropped in 2009. They most definitely talk about that album and its relevancy within the Tribe Called Quest catalog. Um, yeah, that's exactly how I felt when I watched... Um, North Carolina A&T's uh, track program in, in Eugene, Oregon. Just thinking to myself, this is a shell of what they used to be. And um, I'm happy that it happened. 
but sad to see it leave and not like this. But yeah, again, football season is almost here. We're a month away. Let's go. Yeah, I mean, a very somber note to end on, but I will hopefully try to, I guess, cheer you up with this. I mean, the Big South having only six teams and like really no flagship programs, this might be um, NCA and T's year to uh, to win the Big South. And I won't say steal a playoff bid, but I mean, you know, win the conference and, you know, get get what they wanted when they moved out of the MEAC. I will say this. I'm saying it is still. So, um, come homecoming time, we're playing against Campbell. If they beat Campbell, I think that's the one game that everyone has on their docket. If they can beat Campbell, they may be able to win the conference. You know, um, if, in my opinion, if the Aggies win less than seven games, um, or seven games or less, Sam Washington might be out of there. Wow. I, I truly believe they have at least eight winnable games on that schedule, if not more. Um, and again, with Campbell being the one game that a lot of people were afraid of, and I, I kind of scratched my head when I heard about that with them being a three-win team, but excuse me, last season. Um, if this program, program is looking to rebound and looking to make themselves relevant again before they move over to the CAA, they have to win the Big South. In doing so, they have to win against um, with Campbell, and, and, and with, especially with Kennesaw State and Monmouth no longer being, and Hampton no longer being the conference. I truly believe that all the rest of these games are winnable. And um, yeah, they do win the conference. You will see me in the ski mask come November because we would have stolen the conference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll hold you to your word, too. I mean, I want to I want to give a brief, uh, brief shout out to uh, Hajmal. You mentioned Campbell Hajmal Williams, one of the most electric quarterbacks in FCS, um, former U.S. Army prep school attendee or U.S. Military Academy prep school attendee. Kind of makes you wonder what could have been for uh, either what could have been or uh, how they're recruiting so many good quarterbacks out there at West Point, honestly. I mean, I enjoy it, frankly, but I mean, you know, it's kind of sad to see a guy like Hajmal Williams thrive elsewhere when he, when he could have been yours so you know yeah i i'll, I'll just say that <laughs> it, it always hurts when you watch someone who is within your grasp do better elsewhere trust me you're talking to a washington wizards fan and i'm watching the championships right now and Otto porter go <laughs> figure yeah, I mean, shoot, call me greedy because in 2020, um, my, my senior at the academy, Army went through six quarterbacks, you know, all very solid quarterbacks. But so, you know, give me give me as many good quarterbacks Remember as possible. That. I want Haj Malik Williams. Yeah, I want <laughs> I want Haj Malik Williams too in that quarterback room. You know, I mean, I'm glad he's doing good. I'm I'm glad he's doing good now. I mean, hopefully he stays healthy because after 2020, you know, what he did on national TV in front of uh, you know, a few times, like you know, I wanted more Hodge Malik Williams, I mean, in the, in the FCS or in, in the 2021 season. But, um, yeah, hopefully he stays healthy. But, again, it's going to be hard for a to corral, um, corral him, you know, come that come homecoming. So uh, that's just that's just my last remark. Had to had to, uh, I guess, sort of share those feelings of uh, of what could have been. So, yeah, yeah just, I, uh, I yeah. know it's not going to be an easy game. I already know that. My, my thing is, though, if they can somehow win it, um. Get ready. I'm, I'm coming out with a ski mask. I mean, you might need it, too. I mean, because I'm not sure if a and will get a home game. You know, you, I'm not sure if they'll get a home game in the playoffs if they win the Big South. You know, they might have to go uh, to their future CAA compatriots uh, up, up in the Northeast. <laughs> so you might need you might need for that reason, too. <laughs> yeah, I don't even want to think about that just yet. I just want to go ahead and ride out this last run of the Big South and see how this looks before we get to CAA play and um, I get my feelings hurt again. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't. I don't want that for you. But uh, I, I guess in that uh, note, um, and that note, we're hopeful for college football season. We're excited, obviously. And Dwayne, it's, it, as a ple- as always, it's a pleasure. Um, yes, really appreciate it. You know, hope to hope to record again before the season starts. Uh, I'm sure we'll find something. We'll find something to talk about. But um, until next time, everyone, uh, peace, love, and soul.